The second reading this morning is from the 17th chapter of John, verses 20 through 26. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and, I, and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for reading, Jack. Well, this is it. After years of preparation, hard work, and study, everything is about to change. This is the precipice of something new and different. Jesus has come to the end of his ministry on earth. He is hours away from being arrested, condemned, and killed. So what does he do with his final hours? He gets together with his friends one final time. He gathers them together, and after they eat dinner, sharing stories over the meal, after Jesus washes their feet, after he predicts his betrayal, Jesus begins one last teaching. Up until this point, the disciples have been traveling around the country, following Jesus from miracle to miracle, from cryptic teaching to cryptic teaching, And now, as Jesus begins teaching, the disciples hope that he will make everything clear. What's it all meant? What was it all for? Who is Jesus really? Many scholars call this final teaching in the Gospel of John Jesus' farewell discourse. These are his final words before he says goodbye for a time. And this short teaching is packed with some of Jesus' greatest hits. Hits like, All people will know you are my disciples by your love. In my Father's house there are many rooms, and I've gone to prepare a place for you. In this world you will have trouble, but I have overcome the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. My peace I give to you. Let your hearts not be troubled, nor let them be afraid. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Greater love has no one than this, but that someone lay down their life for their friends. These are some of Jesus' greatest hits. They're beautiful. Two chapters and at least seven deeply beautiful and resonant words from Jesus. And then he concludes this final teaching with a prayer, a prayer to God. And that prayer makes up our scripture reading for this morning. It was read in part the beginning and then read at the end. This word of the Lord is a bit dizzying. This prayer that Jesus prays, he keeps looping every request back to his relationship with God and then his relationship with the disciples. He says things like, you are in me and I am in you. May they be in us. Let them be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. I know you and my disciples know you. Let them love with the love which you have loved me and I am in them. So much for making everything plain, am I right? Jesus makes this prayer kind of dizzying. It's easy to get lost in it, to be listening and then to lose the lead, to be following the trail and suddenly realize you've just been going in circles. Why? 
Why does Jesus make his final prayer so circular, so dizzying? Well, one reason, I think, is that sometimes direct, plain, instructive words fall short of capturing the deeper truths that can transform our lives. Hearing a lecture about the physiology of joy is probably pretty interesting, but listening to Beethoven's Ode to Joy will make you burst with joy. Reading a book about how love can be beautiful can inform you, but watching Shakespeare plays, well, that will make you ache for love. Reading about the suffering caused by slavery will inform you, but listening to the blues will make you feel sorrow. This is why scripture is not actually meant to be read like a history book or a science book or a textbook. It's meant to be read like the masterful work of art that it is. Because art is about transformation, not merely information. Art moves us from our heads to our hearts and our guts. Art invites us to look at our whole lives. Jesus speaks in a loopy and dizzying way because he is trying not to inform his disciples anymore, but he's trying to transform them. Jesus speaks this way because he leaves them with a final prayer that rattles around inside of them for years until one day that final prayer will echo out of them in their own prayers. Our sisters and brothers in the Eastern Orthodox tradition of Christianity understand this about art and transformation. It's why their churches are full of icons. It's overwhelming if you walk into a Greek Orthodox church. Now, icons are images of Jesus or God or Bible characters, often covered in gold, and they're meant to figuratively represent the truth of Christ. They're meant to draw us in to deeper adoration of God. As one scholar said, icons have always been understood as a visible gospel. A visible gospel. As a testimony of the great things given to humanity by Christ. Throughout the centuries, Christians have read this dizzying prayer of Jesus's, and instead of untangling it or organizing it and putting it into nice little boxes, they've created art to explore it more deeply, to allow it to transform their hearts. One such rendering of this text is on your bulletin cover this morning. It's a modern icon created by the artist Scott Erickson. He creates all the time, and I love, love his work. This image shows three people sitting around a circular table. This is the Trinity, the Christian belief that God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that somehow they are all one. Our understanding of the Trinity arises in part from this scripture. In this image, each person's cup has a symbol which signifies which person of the Trinity it is. At the top, the cup has a shepherd's hook and a lightning bolt. That's Jesus's cup. To the left is God the Creator with an infinity symbol, eternal and beyond our fathoming. And then to the right, a dove, the traditional symbol for the Holy Spirit. They are represented as three unique persons, each with their own body, their own cup, their own clothing. They are three. In his prayer, Jesus acknowledges that the Father sent him and that he sends the Holy Spirit. He speaks again and again and again of their love. Well, in this image, each person is pouring into a cup to their right, while simultaneously having their cup filled by the person to their left. Each person pours out and pours in at the exact same time. The Trinity revolves around this endless pouring out and pouring in. It revolves around the love that the Trinity shares. 
As I've studied this image, it almost looks like it's already swirling. A swirl of love that is ever giving, ever receiving, ever abundant. Jesus prays that we might model our own love, our own relationships after the love of God. Love that is mutually outpouring. Love overflowing with trust and with joy. Love without hierarchy or coercion. Love that gives freely and receives in equal measure. If God invites us to model our love after the love within God's own life, the love that Jesus and the Father, Jesus and the Spirit, the Spirit and the Father share, then I wonder, in our own relationships, where do we need to accept that other people are different from us? Where do we need to embrace and empower other people's freedom? And then where do we need to grow in connection, to grow in mutuality and trust that oneness that is at the center of this image of who God is? Three around a table of one. Throughout Jesus' prayer, he keeps pulling us into the divine love. It's like he's saying, come on, join us at this table. It's like he's pulling up a fourth chair to the table for you and for me. He says, you're invited, come on in. Bring your baggage, we'll work that out together. He prays that we might understand that we live our lives inside of God's own life. In this image, it's like we are in the center of that little Venn diagram created by the bottom of each chalice coming together. We exist in the center of God's life. We dwell, we reside in this God, and this God's ever-swirling love sustains us. As Jesus faces torture and death, he prays that we might pull up that chair to the table. He prays that we might dwell with God, that we might enter into the divine relationship of mutual outpouring and receiving. Jesus prays that future Christians might know God truly, love others fully, be one completely, and experience the indwelling of Christ in us. How amazing that at the end of Jesus' life, in this prayer, when he is facing his own crisis, he prays for us, for you and for me. Today, we celebrate our high school seniors who are graduating. They are like Jesus on the precipice of change. While they face vastly different futures, Jesus, his death and resurrection, these students, college and new adventures, the fact that much will change is shared. Just as Jesus offered a prayer, my prayer for you seniors is this. May you remember that you belong here. There are some in this congregation today who remember the day you were baptized. Remember the days that you probably came up to these steps and were goofy on the steps and played while listening to a children's time. They remember because they care about you. They love you. We Christians, we love each other imperfectly. There's no promise that we're ever going to get it quite right. But I think in the church, when we see our young people grow up surrounded by the love of a community that cares for them in their uniqueness, then we're reminded of the love of God, that ever outpouring, that ever receiving love of God, because it's been outpoured into each of you. My prayer for you is that you will remember that God calls you to love others just as God loves you just as this congregation has done for you. As you go off to your new adventures, may your minds be filled with wonderful loads of new information and experiences. May it surprise and challenge you. But may you always remember, may all of us always remember that the most important thing 
is your own transformation into a more wise, faithful, and loving person. May all of us spend time reflecting on this image of the Trinity and let Jesus' prayer rattle around inside of us until one day it echoes out from our own voices. May we look upon this image and remember that there is ever more breadth and depth to our God than we can possibly fathom. And may we remember that the true adventure of our lives is walking with God. May we pull up that fourth chair to the table. May we pour out and be filled up. And may we dwell within the dizzying love of our God.